this morning for May 22nd, 2021 at Narkey Street Congregation, we are looking at the spiritual practice of worship. Now today, when we come to an evangelical church in 2021, our idea of worship has been greatly colored by the predominance of popular worship movements birthed out of mega churches like Hillsong in Australia and Bethel in Redding, California, where you have inspired, talented musicians with an ear for contemporary culture mixed with a highly orchestrated presentation that is supported by the state of the art technical team. And this end product of worship music is then recorded and propagated to the world using the latest social media algorithms on the internet. And then these worship songs are then played over and over on loop on YouTube by the rest of us, mediocre musicians and average singers, trying our best to reproduce that same spirit-filled vibe. But let me be clear, I'm not casting judgment on what we call modern worship today in the 21st century. Uh, but before we begin to talk about the spiritual discipline of worship this morning, we should first recognize what may be some of our worship stereotypes. Let's always keep in mind that we as humans are always biased when it comes to taste and culture. One person likes spicy food, another person prefers meat and potatoes. One person likes comedies, someone else likes tragedies. We can be influenced by cultural expectations or personality preferences or community traditions. But true worship is not based on taste or tradition. And real worship is not determined by culture. If there is any conclusion this morning, worship of the Lord is an expression of the heart. Like going on a date, you can buy the chocolate and the flowers and you can go to the fanciest restaurant. You can turn the lights down low as the mood music plays in the background. But if there's not a romantic interest between the two parties, it's not real. Richard Foster says, to worship is to experience reality, to touch life. It is to know, to feel, to experience the resurrected Christ in the midst of the gathered community. God is actively seeking worshipers. Worship is our response to the overtures of love from the heart of the Father. Its central reality is found in spirit and truth. It is kindled within us only when the spirit of God touches our human spirit. Forms and rituals do not produce worship. We can use all the right techniques and methods. We can have the best possible liturgy, but we have not worshiped the Lord until spirit touches spirit. So our worship is not based on the piano or guitar or drums or smoke or mood lighting or incense. These are all forms that can complement praise and worship, but they are only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal if our heart is not present. As the prophet Samuel was searching out a new king for Israel in the family of Jesse, the first seven sons of Jesse were brought before Samuel to see if they might be the next anointed of Israel. But it was the eighth son, David, who was physically absent but who was spiritually present. He, he would be the next king of Israel. David, as we all know, was called a man after God's own heart. And as the Lord told Samuel that day, when Eliab, Jesse's oldest son, was presented to him, the Lord told Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so worship is based on relationship. It's how God sees us and how we see him. We worship God based on how we look at him and how we relate to him. In the English language, we have this word 
that we use that we call worship. But in Hebrew, there really is no one word. The closest example in the Hebrew Bible for worship is the word hishtachave, which literally means falling prostrate before someone of a higher standing, like a king or bowing down to show honor to maybe a visitor. For example, Abraham bows down before the people in Hebron when he asked to buy the cave of Machpelah so he can bury Sarah, his wife in Genesis 23, or in Genesis 33, when Jacob approaches his brother Esau, Jacob bows down to the ground seven times as a sign of honor, as Jacob is seeking reconciliation with his brother. But this word, hishtachave, is also the same word that's used when Abraham takes Isaac to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. In Genesis 22, verse 5, it says, Abraham said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Now in the Hebrew, it literally says, we will bow down, and then we will come back. Our translations have interpreted this word as we will worship. Because the context of the verse is based around making a sacrifice and offering to the Lord. So worshiping the Lord or bowing down to him seems to initially involve an altar and a sacrifice. Moses draws the outlines of worship further by connecting worship or bowing down with service. Look at Exodus 20, starting in verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. And then verse 5, you shall not bow down to them, worship them, or serve them. And this is a constant refrain of the book of Deuteronomy, warning the people not to bow down, not to worship, and serve other gods. Because when you bow down before someone, like a king or a master, you show that they are greater than yourself, and you recognize that you are subservient to them. We serve and obey the one which we bow down to, the one that we worship. Paul says in Romans 6.16, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Before Joshua died, he challenged the people in Joshua 24, starting in verse 14. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me, in my household, we will serve the Lord. So here, when Joshua talks about the fear of the Lord, this is a tie-in to worship, fear, honor, respect, where the Israelites must choose who they will honor and respect and fear. Who will be their God? Who will be their king? Who will be their master? And seven times, here, Joshua brings up the subject of service in this context of worship, because worship is truly an act of service. In fact, it is a lifestyle of wholehearted service. We can only worship the one we serve, and we will only serve the one we worship. It is not confined to a moment of emotion or a long forgotten commitment of fealty. Worship must be real and 
it must be real on a daily basis, just like any relationship. Today, when we imagine what worship looks like, we often think of music, special lights, or fancy displays. But as we've noted earlier, the base meaning of worship is simply a sign of humility, of bowing down and sacrificing to the Lord. Because our worship recognizes God is Lord and that we choose to serve him. Now, later on in the second temple writing of the book of Chronicles, you find the early stages of worship mixed with music that we're used to hearing. And it's found there in the temple of Jerusalem. For example, when Solomon, King Solomon is dedicating the temple in second Chronicles seven, it describes Solomon and the people sacrificing to the Lord while the Levites hold instruments and the priests blow trumpets. And then 200 years later, King Hezekiah purified Jerusalem's temple at the beginning of his reign. In 2 Chronicles 29, starting in verse 25, it describes the Levites in the temple of the Lord with symbols, harps, and lyres, as David prescribed, and God, the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet. Verse 26, so the Levites stood ready with David's instruments and the priests with their trumpets. Hezekiah gave the order to sacrifice the burnt offering on the altar. And as the offering began, singing to the Lord began also, accompanied by trumpets and the instruments of David, king of Israel. The whole assembly bowed in worship while the musicians played and the trumpets sounded. All this continued until the sacrifice of the burnt offering was completed. And when the offerings were finished, the king and everyone present with him knelt down and worshiped. King Hezekiah and his officials ordered the Levites to praise the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. And so they sang praises with gladness and they bowed down and worshiped. So interestingly, here in the time of King Hezekiah, we have songs, possibly they're the Psalms that we know from the Bible, composed by King David and Asaph that are being sung in the temple in Jerusalem. But as we all know, 100 years after Hezekiah, Jerusalem's, Jerusalem's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. Jerusalem's center of sacrifice and musical worship would be silenced for a season. But then eventually the temple was rebuilt under the leadership of Zerubbabel and the high priest Joshua. And this great house of worship continued to function into the time of Jesus. So in the time of Jesus, you'll recall in John chapter 4, there was a particular story when Jesus and his disciples were traveling through Samaria, which was enemy territory for the Jews. And there in Samaria, near the ancient biblical city of Shechem, Jesus met a Samaritan woman at a well. That tradition said that was the well that Jacob, the patriarch, had dug. And Jesus and this Samaritan woman began to have a conversation. And in the midst of this discussion, she said to Jesus in John chapter 4, starting in verse 19, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So here this woman has brought up this ancient controversy that has separated the Samaritans and the Jews for many, many years. According to Samaritan tradition, they had built a temple on Mount Gerizim near Shechem as the place where they worshiped God, while the Jews, according to the Bible, built their temple on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. 
So Jesus answers the, the lady in verse 21 of John chapter 4. Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. And here Jesus is putting that political, that religious, that cultural argument to the side, and he's getting to the heart of the matter. Jesus does not want to argue over the right form of worship or the right place of worship. He wants to discuss the heart. He wants to discuss the relationship. Because ultimately, the fight between the Samaritans and the Jews is not political. It's not religious. It's not cultural. The problem is found in the heart of the people. As Jesus continues on in verse 22. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. And we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. For God is Spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. Imagine... If you were to hear those words of Jesus 2,000 years ago, while the temple in Jerusalem still stood, and it still operated on a daily basis as the official place of worship, and it was on that temple mount where Abraham attempted to sacrifice Isaac, but was stopped by an angel, and it was there on that temple mount where David bought the threshing floor, or Rabna, at the end of the plague that was devastating the people in Jerusalem. And it was there on that same temple mount where Solomon, son of David, then built the original temple. Up until then, more than a thousand years of tradition had identified Mount Moriah, Mount Zion, as the very throne of the Lord God. It was a place of honor and respect and revelation. It was a place of worship. It was there that the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 6 of his book, he personally witnessed the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphim, each with six wings. And with two wings they covered their faces. And with two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. So, if there was any place that had been identified as the proper place to worship for the Jewish people. It was there on the Temple Mount of Jerusalem. But when Jesus said that the Father is seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth, he was speaking about the heart. God is seeking those who want to worship him, who desire to worship him. The heart is where we consciously choose to recognize God as Lord, the sovereign Lord over all the universe, the one who is greater than any city, the one who is greater than any temple, and the one who is greater than any people. Because worship is a posture of humility it's a bowing of the heart. There can be no pride in worship. There can be no claims on the best place to worship or the best form of worship. Worship takes our eyes off of ourselves, takes our eyes off of our political persuasions, off of our religious assumptions and our cultural expectations. Worship pours our hearts out to the king of the universe. The heart in the Bible is not just about emotions, love. The biblical heart also includes our mind and our thoughts. So contrary to the Western society stereotype about the emotional heart only, the heart in the Bible, yes, it is where the emotions are, but the heart in the Bible is also where rational decisions are made. The heart is where we choose today whom we will serve. Worship is choosing to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, 
and with all of our strength. And we, we all worship because worship is ultimately a corporate discipline. Yes, you can worship the Lord in your personal life, but true worship is fulfilled in the gathering of the community. Among the body of believers, I becomes we, as worship reminds us that we are not alone in our pursuit of the Lord. When we gather together our individual embers, the fire of the Holy Spirit is stoked in our midst. As Martin Luther said, at home in my own house, there is no warmth or vigor in me. But in church, when the multitude is gathered together, a fire is kindled in my heart and it breaks its way through. Worship is truly a discipline that's built on our relationship with the Lord and built on our relationships with one another. In conclusion, Foster says, worship centers in the experience of reality, real worship real confession, real praise, real adoration. The forms of worship must always be subject to the reality of worship. So how can we sum up what real worship looks like? I would say real worship begins with humbly recognizing where we currently stand in our relationship with the Lord Almighty, however far we are along in our journey with him. For example, when I was a child, I could only relate to my father on a simple level. I could see my father as a provider of food and shelter, a guardian, a protector. Our topics of conversation were limited by my life experience and knowledge. When I grew into a teenager and I gained more autonomy and awareness, I often, unfortunately, assumed that I knew more than my father did. And then as I continued to grow up, again, my relationship with my father also changed. I started understanding that his advice and wisdom had oftentimes been relevant and worthy of respect. And then when I became a father myself, I quickly came to realize that all of my life answers, how I was going to fix everything my father had done wrong, I realized that all of these big plans of mine were nothing new under the sun. In fact, I had arrogantly judged my father based on my immaturity. But through it all, my father always loved me, and I always loved him, simply because he was my father and I was his son. And despite the ups and downs of my journey with him, he always had my respect and my honor. So while the form of our relationship was constantly changing, the love did not. Likewise, our worship of the Lord is a long journey of maturity, of recognizing truth and learning about the Spirit. We are all on different journeys with the Lord. Some of us are children, some of us are teenagers, some of us are adults, and some of us are elders. And where we are on that journey is not the most important detail. It's the long arc of that relationship that matters. Do we worship and do we serve the Lord from the heart? That's what matters. How easy and how human it is to forget our first love and to ignore why we worship and instead focus on how we worship. I will end with this rabbinic story from Judah He Hasid, from Sefer Hasidim. There was a certain man who was a herdsman, and he did not know how to pray. But it was his custom to say every day, Lord of the world, 
It is apparent and known unto you that if you had cattle and gave them to me to take care of, though I take payment for caring for other people's cattle, from you I would take nothing because I love you. Once a scholar was going his way and came upon the simple herdsman who was praying like he normally did. And the scholar said to him, fool, do not pray like that. The herdsman asked him, well, how should I pray? So the scholar then taught him the benedictions in order and how to recite the Shema and the Amidah so that from then on, he would not say his usual prayer. After the scholar had gone away, the herdsman forgot all that had been taught him. And so he did not pray. He was even afraid to say what he normally prayed, since the righteous man had told him not to. But the scholar had a dream at night. And in that dream, he heard a voice saying, if you do not tell the herdsman to pray what he normally prayed before you met him, know that misfortune will overtake you. For you have robbed me of one who belongs to the world to come. So at once the scholar got up and he went to the herdsman and he asked him, what prayer are you praying? The herdsman answered, none, for I have forgotten what you taught me and you forbade me to say my usual prayer. Then the scholar told him what he had dreamed and he added, say what you used to say. Behold, here there is neither Torah nor works, but only this, that there was one who had it in his heart to do good, and he was rewarded for it, as if this were a great thing, for the merciful one desires the heart.